All right, everybody. Thank you so much. Um, my paperwork went through this morning, so I am uh, officially a doctor. And this is my first presentation as Dr. Parker. So I am so incredibly grateful for everybody um, giving me your time today. Um, it means a lot to be able to talk about this place, the Clemson Experimental Forest, a place that so many people care about and love. And I'm really excited to discuss some of this, um, this research that I've spent several years on. So, oh, got to move a couple of things here. Okay, here we go. All right, first, I want to thank everybody. Thank you so much for everyone coming out onto this call, all of my friends and family who have given me so much support over the years and have listened to me so patiently um, try to <laughs> do <this> <laughs> um, So yes, thank you so much, everyone. I would like to point out though, um, I would like to extend my gratitude to everyone that I got to work with on this project. All of my colleagues in Dr. Baldwin's Conservation Social Science Lab, as well as all my colleagues in the Land Asset Committee, my funders for this project and my committee members as well. Everyone here uh, who guided me through this process and all my teachers. I would specifically like to point out Dr. Betty Baldwin. Um, it is my heartfelt wish that everyone gets to have a mentor like I've been able to have um, with Dr. Baldwin. Somebody who can teach you how to be a better professional, but more importantly, uh, a better human. Um, and for that, I will have my um, infinite gratitude. So thank you so much. Okay, we're gonna talk about the forest. Before we do, I wanna share an experience that I had back in December. I had just spent three months of furiously writing my, uh, my dissertation, this, this manuscript, which this presentation is based on. And I had to step away, I had to get away from it all. I'd just been in my office for three months. And <laughs> <laughs> just as a reminder, would, uh, would everyone yeah, mind? Yeah, mute your microphone. Yeah, would everyone mind putting their uh, mic on mute, please? I am. Thanks so much. <laughs> All right, um, so I'd just like to share this experience that I had. I had to step away after writing the manuscript and I realized I was gonna be leaving the South in a bit, so I wanted to go see more of it. So I traveled down to Alabama. I went to the Space Museum and I saw the Saturn V rocket and I saw some other things. And I decided to go even further south down into Montgomery, realized I needed to learn more about the civil rights history of the area. So as I was going through Montgomery, I visited the Edmund Pettus Bridge, a few of the churches, um, the Rosa Parks Memorial, and then I came across the National Memorial for Peace and Justice. And I have to say, it was one of the most poignant experiences of my life going through that memorial and just filled with tears the entire time as I was walking through and learning as much as I could and, and really just talking to as many people as I could. And it wasn't until I was leaving when I saw this quote by one of the founders, Brian Stevenson, who had, the opposite of poverty is not wealth. The opposite of poverty is justice. Now, I couldn't make that make sense. Why was this quote about poverty and wealth and justice in this place that is an, a memorial to the victims of lynching in the United States? It didn't make sense to me. I couldn't really see the connection. So I played with this idea all weekend. And it wasn't until my drive back to Clemson, where it just kind of clicked, that I think he's right. I think these are all different manifestations of this idea of justice. And I bring this up because I challenge you, I encourage you, think about this quote as we talk about the forest today, as we think about this issue, as we think about this place. And we're gonna come back to it here at the end. All right, now in the manuscript, I do go a little bit further back into the history of the land. But for the sake of today, I'm gonna to talk about the Clemson Forest where most people talk about the forest in the 1930s. 
And Freya, the wonder pup here, is going to guide us through this conversation here. Um, the forest as we currently have is, is about 17 and a half thousand acres, and it surrounds Clemson University here in upstate South Carolina. And in the 1930s, the land was pretty destroyed after over 100, 150 years of exploitative agriculture, a lot of it slavery agriculture. The topsoil was all gone. There was a lot of drought. And when it was raining, there was a lot of flooding, sheet flooding. The people were very impoverished. And Dr. All, at the time, a Clemson faculty member, was listening to President Roosevelt in his fireside chats explain the New Deal and his ideas for revitalizing the country. And Dr. All said, you know, I think we can fix the area here. I think we can take it from the Dust Bowl-like conditions that we have here and we can fix this land. So he started about a 10-year project, basically a resettlement project, where he resettled over 200 families and reorganized the land. And he started working with the federal government to, do, to work with the WPA and the Civilian Conservation Corps to reforest about 30,000 acres of land. And he did all of that for the sake of community development. That was his initial purpose. That was his initial stated goal, to develop this community, to really um, empower this community. Now, if we fast forward about 10 years or so, the trees have started growing, the timber industry in the South has started growing, and the Clemson president at the time, um, Dr. Poole, visited Duke University. And he came back from Duke and he saw the, the forest and how they were managing the forest there. And he came back and told his manager, uh, Norbert Goebel, he said, you're gonna manage this forest for timber harvest. And more or less since that time, that is how the forest has been managed. And on any day, on any given day, if you go out into the forest, you're gonna see all kinds of activities. You're gonna see mountain biking, you're gonna see horseback riding, you're gonna see uh, professors teaching class, researchers doing research, um, hunters, anglers. You're gonna see all kinds of things. And all of it is made possible by the timber harvest that brings in the revenue from this land. And for the most part, that's been all fine and good up until the last couple decades. And in the last couple decades, the region of the Southeast has grown dramatically in population. And as Toronto points out, over the next few decades, it's expected to grow even more. Over the next few decades, it's expected to grow 100, 150, and even 200% in some areas. And as that population growth, as that sprawl development is what we call it, increases, it puts pressures on natural areas. And those pressures can be a lot of different things. Pressures of use, new types of use. Um, those pressures can be misuse even. Or they can just be losing the natural areas to that sprawl development, to that tarmac and concrete going up all over the area. And that's exactly what's being experienced here in the Clemson Experimental Forest Area. As you can see, the counties surrounding uh, the forest are growing dramatically in population as well. And already the quality of life metrics for the state of South Carolina are fairly poor in comparison to the other states. Domestic violence is high, life expectancy, the health, the obesity, the poverty rate is high, and so many more. So as this population increases, as this sprawl development increases, these quality of life metrics will also be challenged. And it will be a challenge to understand how to integrate that better. Now, the current forest mission statement to cover all of those activities, all of those future challenges uh, that were just discussed is this. The prime directive for the forest is to be a well-managed, self-sustaining, ecologically healthy, living laboratory, classroom and recreational resource for the benefit of the university, commerce and citizenry of South Carolina, vouchsafed with a mandate to protect and promote in perpetuity the forest as an irreplaceable, educational, environmental, scientific, and social asset. <sighs> Take a breath. Okay. So in the midst of these increasing pressures regionally, 
The land is threatened by activities that can change its identity. So how do we understand this? Well, we have to come up with a couple of questions. And this first question is the first question that I, that I came up with. And I actually didn't like it. It was a question that I thought I was going to change as the, pro as the research went on. What is the purpose of the Clemson Experimental Forest? But as we went forward, I realized it's actually the best question. It's what guided all of our research, and it's what guided all of the discussions with everybody. But as we went forward, I came up with two other questions. What are the available options so that the university can continue valuing the land the best? And what is the current and desired identity of the land and community? So how did I do this? Well, first off, I was what is called an embedded researcher. I live in this community. I live right next to the forest. I go to Clemson University. I'm paid by Clemson University. I tried to go to as many meetings as possible. Um, I have 130 plus miles of trails. That is easily over 200 miles of trails that I did. Same thing with the field days. Um, I had what I called um, Friday office hours. So if you wanted to come talk to me about the forest, you had to go walk the trails with me. I took over 1,700 photos, which some of which you're going to see, you're seeing in the presentation today. I was doing exclusively qualitative research with inductive data collection. And I started this project in August of 2018, but I've been here since August of 2016. Now, my primary data collection methods were artifact discovery. I also did informal interviews that led to formal interviews of decision leaders. And then some of my supporting data collection uh, methods include, included doing inventories, helping the rest of the conservation social science lab do um, surveys of forest users. I helped the Clemson, I helped Dr. Uh, Weathers and Dr. Baldwin do surveys of Clemson uh, University faculty. I did comparative forest analyses, and I also maintained an audit trail to help make sense of all this. When I say artifacts, I mean basically any document, map, um, land management plan, historic documents, uh, anything. Anything can be an artifact. And I read as many books as possible, as many websites I checked out, social media, the uh, Clemson library uh, librarians were incredible. Um, and I spent a week down in the Clemson uh, library archive searching through all kinds of fun stuff. And so this is just some of the examples of artifacts that I researched. I also looked at all different kinds of uh, forests. And I looked at these different kinds of forests for how they were similar, maybe in size, whether they were other university forests, whether they were other forests for research or, or just you know, different characteristics. And I called up their forest managers and I asked them questions, including um, what kind of problems do you have in your forest? Uh, do you have some of the same problems that we have? How do you, have you dealt with them? And we got some good information from that. And this is really the bread and butter of a lot of this research. Um, I had a, what we call a system of social actors. And so I have 15 informal interviews on here. Again, this number could be much higher because I was probably pretty annoying. Um, I, every time I was out in the forest, I had these little business cards that I gave out and I just wanted to hear everyone's opinion. Um, so I asked everyone to give me a call, shoot me an email, tell me about your experience in the forest. I wanna know. But that led to understanding who the decision leaders amongst these categories within the social system might be. And we set up what I call formal interviews. And the, the distinction is that I got ethical approval. I got approval from the ethics office from Clemson University to do these interviews. Um, it's called the IRB, the Institutional Review Board. And so each of these 30 interviews was anonymous and confidential. They were all about two hours long. Some were significantly shorter and some were significantly longer. I recorded all of them, video and audio, um, where I could. And then I transcribed all those interviews and I put it through MaxQDA software and I coded everything. And I coded everything in comparison to the other data streams as well. Or initially I came out with several thousand coded segments. I brought that down to 1700 coded seg segments to utilize. Um, I brought that then into what we call thematic categories to really understand 
how this forest is valued and what the purpose of this forest is. And so what did we hear? Well, we heard from everyone in the social system, but even if you've never set foot in the boundaries of the Clemson forest, you're still interacting with it. The forest is a crown jewel of this area. The fact that it exists is reason enough. You can't recreate a Clemson forest once you've developed it. Let's establish a goal of no net loss of acreage. The forest has been described as the forest that saved the upstate. Clemson is really a 20,000 acre campus. The forest is my medicine. And the Clemson Forest is just that super critical piece of recreation and quality of life. And that's just the best use. If you want real significant natural areas, there are more of them up in the mountains. If you want great timber, you kind of have to go to land that isn't quite so worn out from cotton. A lot of people we talked to got emotional about the forest. This forest has a big value in people's lives. The forest is still our biggest classroom. It is still our best classroom. One of my favorite quotes, this is somebody else telling me, one of my favorite quotes, the highest reward for a person's toil is not what they get for it, but what they become from it. If someone else comes into our community, are we prepared to be changed by them? Or is it only a thought that we're going to change them? So what do we become? I love these. Clemson is in the forever business. Clemson sees the land as sacred. Okay, so that was my data. I took all that data I, that was inductively collected and I inductively analyzed it. And I created what I call the nine social values to understand what the purpose of the forest is. And these are the, uh, the values are the economics with a focus on timber forestry, the academics, what we mean by that is teaching and research, the quality of life value, um, the recreation value. And I think recreation could and probably should go in quality of life, but so much of the data and so many people specifically pointed out recreation that I separated it. I also have communications as one of the main values and go into that further in the questions. Seeing it as a 20,000 20, acre campus and what that actually means. The spirituality value of the forest, the existence value of the forest, and then what I'm calling boundaries out, the role that this natural area plays to other research, to other forests, to the region, to the nation, you know, everything beyond the forest. I then took those nine social values and I compared it to the other perspectives of the purpose. Uh, the mission that we already addressed, but then also the two other offices that oversee the management of the forest. And these include the PSA that sees it for its teaching, research, and demonstration value. And then the real estate office, the office that's responsible for the university's land and capital asset stewardship. They see the value of the land through its timber, agriculture, and development asset. Now they know that there are other assets, they just don't fully understand what they all are and they don't really know how to integrate them all together. So this identification of the nine social values can help get us to that goal and help us understand all these different perspectives together. Okay, so that was what was inductively collected, inductively analyzed. I then took that same data and I deductively analyzed it through these three frameworks here. These are payment for ecosystem services, what is called donut economics, and then this infinity loop here, which is called panarchy. In the manuscript, I dig into all three of these, um, actually too much. That was uh, the one thing I have to change significantly from the manuscript is um, editing that. But just for the sake of today, I'm only gonna talk about um, panarchy and explain what panarchy is. Now, panarchy is a way to understand transformation. And when the panarchy loop was introduced to me by Dr. Fryman a few years ago, for better or for worse, it changed the way that I really see the world. I see everything through this transformative loop now. Um, and it, I've, I think it's been very helpful to me, but we'll see. 
Uh, so a couple ways to understand panarchy. There's four different sections of it, but you can understand it through the front loop and the back loop. The front loop, what they call here incremental innovation, is uh, we're all searching for the same goal. Um, everyone's focused on the same thing. Everything's going forward in that, in that way. And then at the end of each of these loops here is what's called a tipping point or a trigger. And for a variety of reasons, which we'll discuss, uh, the front loop will go into the back loop. And here they call the back loop radical innovation. I've also seen it called chaos. Um, I've also seen it called um, an ad hocracy, decisions made by ad hoc ways. Um, a couple of things to point out about Panarchy here, they have these things called traps. Before you hit a tipping point or a trigger, you can get stuck in a trap. They have this here as rigidity trap and poverty trap. I've also seen these called um, bureaucracy traps. The idea is you're doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. So I guess the last two things to point out about panarchy here is that panarchies can, panarchy scales can occur at multiple different scales. You can have a transformation loop within yourself, within your household, your community, your region, your nation, et cetera. And a lot of times when the higher level panarchy changes, it changes the loops, it changes the transformation for everything below it. That's not always the case, but it does happen. And I guess the other thing to point out here is um, there's three ways you can get into the back loop too. Um, there's more than that, but there's three main ways. One is like a very, dramatic, sometimes they call it violent way to get into the back loop. This is, um, you can understand this like what COVID did in March, 2020, COVID hit and we all shut down and we all went from the front loop, we got shut down and we all went into the back loop very quickly. Another way is what Dr. All did. He shepherded or stewarded the system into the back loop. He released the land from exploitative agriculture and then reorganized it into a forest. And then since then, it's been in the front loop. Another way that we'll talk about in a second is what's called drift. The transformation can then drift into the back loop as well. <laughs> okay, so I took all that data, put it through those three frameworks, and I still had a lot of stuff. And so I had to make it make sense. And so one of the ways that I figured out how to make this data make sense is I created what I call an expected found typology. Data that I expected to find and did find. Data that I expected to find but did not find. Data that I did not expect but did find. And data that I didn't expect and didn't find. Um, this is an amended table from the manuscript, but just a couple examples here. Um, I did expect that the main thing that people were afraid of was losing the land through death by a thousand cuts, losing major continuity and connectivity, waking up and seeing bulldozers out there one day. And I think we did find that. I, I do think that that is one of the main fears. Now I expected, but did not find that most recreationalists, um, they're not anti-tree cutting. For whatever reason, I had in my head that most of the people out there would be anti-tree cutting. But other than a couple of folks, everyone's pretty understanding that this is a working forest and they understand the rationale behind the, those kinds of activities. And like I mentioned before, I, this third category was actually the longest. I did not expect but found so many things, including that Clemson administrators actually truly do see this land and the land that they have as sacred. They truly do value this land. And I did not expect that. As a side note, I don't know if the rest of the community knows that the administrators truly see the land as sacred. And, or if they do, I don't know if they believe them. And then also same thing with the Clemson is in the forever business. I truly do believe that a lot of the administrators of this university um, do believe that Clemson is in the forever business, then that is their responsibility. And then for the last one, I did not expect to find a strong preservationist mindset. Basically put up a fence, don't let anybody go out onto the land. Um, and I don't think we found that. I think everybody likes to use this land. I think everyone understands that this land is uh, here for the community. Okay, 
So then I took all the data from that and I created a few lists to be able to make it digestible for actual land managers here. And two of the lists that I created, list of opportunities or ideas and a list of threats or challenges. And there's a lot here, a um, couple of them on the list of ideas and opportunities. The idea of putting some or all of the forest in a carbon sequestration market to make funds in a new way. Uh, doing longitudinal, do, doing new kinds of research on the forest, longitudinal studies, for example. Uh, doing agroecology or agroforestry or new ways of design, actually having trails that go from the campus out into the forest, part of that 20,000 acre cam uh, campus idea. And then over here with the threats, the challenges. Like I said, I did expect the sprawl challenges to be a big problem, but I saw it as sprawl in, the pressures into the forest. What I didn't expect is what I call sprawl out the role that a contiguous natural area can play in an increasingly developed region and the threat that would happen from losing that. Okay, so we have all that data, we have all these different ideas and threats, and then we can start to come up with maybe some ideas of where might we be, where might this system be on this panarchy loop? And I think that we are in the front loop and I think that we're at the top of the front loop somewhere. Now I say this for a few reasons. One, I don't think there has been a radical innovation to pull us into the back loop yet. I don't think climate change has hit yet um, to really damage this forest to a major extent. I don't think there's been major bark beetle infestations or forest fires. Um, I don't think that there's been something like Dr. All has done and just completely transformed the landscape. So I think we're in the front loop for that reason. But another reason is when you break down those nine social values, you can start to see it in some different capacities. Quality of life. I think everyone could probably agree that the forest contributes really heavily to the quality of life for the students and the faculty and the community in this area. But then when we look at some things like recreation or academics, there's a possibility that we're actually drifting into the back loop a little bit. And I say that because a lot of the faculty members don't know that they have to get permission to teach classes out in the forest, or they have to get permission to do research out in the forest. They don't know who to contact. They don't know what the forest really is for. So if they do decide to go out in the forest, they do it without official permission sometimes. And so that is an ad hoc decision of how to have teaching and research out there. Same thing with recreation. Sometimes recreationalists will just create their own trails or they will cut trees that have um, gone over trails or they'll make their own ad hoc decisions. It's not all the time, but sometimes that occurs. So I think there might be a little bit of a drift um, into the back loop in that capacity. And then the last one I'm thinking, when we look at economics, the only revenue generation that occurs on the forest is timber harvest. So there might be a possibility that we're in a little bit of a rigidity trap. I don't know if this is true, but there is a possibility that we're doing more and the more, more and more of the same thing, expecting a different result. And there's a possibility that we could open up this system by looking at carbon market sequestra carbon sequestration markets or recreational plans or something else to open up the revenue generation potential and actually value this land um, along with all the ecosystem services as well. Okay, so we've got the nine social values. We've got some rough predictions for panarchy and seeing where we are with transformation. I feel good. We could put a nice big bow on this. We can go walk out in the forest. We can go jump off this dock and go for a swim and have a great time. Except that I was what is called an embedded researcher in this system. And I had experiences out here that didn't make sense in comparison to the other data or, in, or looking at it through the frameworks and theories that I was working with. But they were important enough that I couldn't ignore either. And in the literature, we call these types of experiences ruptures of normativity. 
but they're also called troubling the clarity or possibly a, a deconstruction of what's going on. And it's best understood through your own life. Think about any time you brought on somebody new into your life or any time you've had a, a significant move or taken on a new job or, or any time you've had a loss or a car accident or something serious that has challenged you to reevaluate or reprioritize your previously normal way of seeing the world. Well, I had a few of those experiences. And I had to make those uh, experiences make sense. Now, I guess if you're gonna go for a doctorate, you're gonna be somewhat geeky in some stuff. And uh, this is kind of where I geek out. I geek out in what's called critical theory um, philosophy. Um, I would love to spend this whole time talking about this stuff, but I'm not gonna bore you. Uh, I will mention that uh, I did look at a few other philosophies like deep ecology, non-human personhood, and some others. But it wasn't until I rediscovered um, object-oriented ontology, or what's called triple O, that these ruptures started to make more sense. Now, triple O is a fairly complex theory. Uh, I'm only going to touch on two of the main things uh, that they, they consider everything is an object. Now, traditional philosophy, traditional theory makes a duality between subject and object, um, mind and body. Now, the subject is usually something with consciousness or sentience, um, and an object is not. And objects are usually for subjects to use, and subjects are usually prioritized or positioned or privileged over objects. Well, Triple O does away with all that. It says, no, that's silly. There's no such thing as a subject as an, or an object. There's only objects. And there are objects that have what they call qualities of sentience or consciousness. And then there are objects that have qualities of photosynthesis or the ability to see in larger spectrums of the electromagnetic spectrum. So there's no reason to privilege any of these objects over one another automatically. And if we do that, then we assess why we do that. And that's what's called a flat ontology. So everything is seen from a flat ontology first and then assessed going forward. Now, I had three of these ruptures. Um, or I had many of these ruptures, but I wrote about three in the manuscript. And what I learned from y'all here in the South is that y'all have haints. And haints are ghosts that haunt a place, a haunt of somebody. And haints need to be reconciled with before you can go forward. And one of the haints that I experienced was um, dealing with uh, a forester, having a conversation, a good conversation with a forester. Now, next week is my 17 year anniversary in conservation. It's something I'm very, very proud of but I would like to believe that I know conservation pretty well, um, but I'm constantly reminded that I don't. And this experience with this forester and understanding natural resource allocation really challenged the way that um, I see conservation. So that was one of those things. Another hint uh, was when I realized that there is very little acknowledgement. And when there is acknowledgement, it's not always great acknowledgement, of the native peoples that lived here, the Cherokee that lived here. So for a variety of reasons, I decided to call them up. And I talked to a member of the Cherokee Nation, not a representative, but a member of the Cherokee Nation. And um, I asked him, you know, what are your opinions on land management decisions on land that your people were forcibly removed from? It's a very difficult issue. It's a very awkward thing to bring up, but we, I had to address it. I had to at least understand it so that we could go forward. But the, the hint that I'm gonna discuss here today is with the hint of what I call mutant agriculture and forgotten cemeteries. And for a variety of reasons, I learned that there is a forgotten cemetery behind the Morgan poultry farm um, out between campus and the forest. And it is believed that this cemetery is a cemetery, a graveyard of um, enslaved peoples or African-Americans in general. And they think that 
because it is next to the Hopewell plantation and also next to what I found in the artifacts as um, the old Negro church. And so because it's on the research farm, I had to get access to it. And so I finally got access and you have to go through a slight decontamination process. So I put on these little booties here and I was escorted out into an area that is marked off by these little canvas lines. And I walk out onto the land and right beside me, by the way, is all the, the research, all the research on chickens. So there is just this cacophony of chaos these chickens just screaming their heads off right next to me. And I walk onto this land trying to understand what I'm seeing. And this red tailed hawk flies up onto a branch right above me. And from my work in California, working with some of the native peoples and some of the folks that are a little bit more reverential um, of the site, we had this thing where anytime a hawk or an eagle would fly by, it was the ancestors looking down on you, checking out what you're doing. And so whether I believe that or not, um, it definitely focused my attention on what I was looking at. And what I was looking at was about 60 unmarked graves of unknown origin. And there's about two headstones, a few footstones. And at some point, I couldn't figure out when or where, um, somebody put these little PVC pipe and metal pipes out there to identify where these graves are. Otherwise, you're just going to see these little indentations in the ground. So I'm out there trying to understand this, trying to play with these ideas. I'm taking photos, really focusing in, on the area. And somebody from the research farm comes over and they say, boy, you got to come check this out. We got a three-legged chicken. And I was so taken aback and so confused. And I politely declined and said, no, I appreciate it. Thank you. I'm trying to have this experience here. And then another person comes over later and I decline them. And then two, three, I think it was four people actually come over and invited me to come see this three-legged chicken. And by the end of it, I was so frustrated because I was trying to have what to me is the closest thing to a reverential or a spiritual experience, trying to understand this land. And they're distracting me with this abomination of what's going on. And so after about an hour, I was starting to leave and I was opening the gate to leave. And finally, one other person comes over and holding up their phone with this photo on it. And they say, you gotta see this. And I was about to put some bass into my voice uh, when I saw this photo. And for whatever reason, it clicked. Right in front of me is an expression, an example of mutant agriculture. And I just spent an hour trying to understand the victims of this mutant agriculture that had occurred right here. And I saw that they're one and the same. And I saw that there are, they are connected. And I don't know how they're connected fully, but I do know that they are. And so for me, that is a hint that needs to be reconciled with. Whether we reconcile with it before we go forward or as we go forward, it's something that needs to be addressed. Now, as I was writing all this up, it occurred to me that there might be an infinity of haints out in the forest. As Eduardo Cohn says, all forests are haunted, not just by their past, but by their future. And the things that I care about, the rare, um, threatened, and endangered species, I was thinking about in the midst of the sixth great extinction on the history of this planet, what is the role and maybe even the responsibility of a forest that didn't exist a hundred years ago, that is a man-made forest? What is that role and responsibility to the protection and preservation maybe of rare, threatened and endangered species? Again, I don't fully know the answer to that, but I do know that there is an answer to that. And so I think that's something that we need to address. So have all these results, have all these ideas, reconciling with the haints. And in the last chapter of the manuscript, what I try to do is I try to take some of the lessons that I learned here in this forest with these forest people, and I try to maybe understand conservation globally a little bit differently. Now, conservation is often framed as a crisis discipline. 
And instead, one of the things that I learned from the forest people is that conservation can also be a creative discipline. Maybe conservation can be seen as a creative expression of social justice. Again, this goes back to that earlier um, quote by Brian Stevenson, but it also is exactly what Dr. All did here on this land. And in conversation with one of my brothers, we were trying to talk through um, what Michael Soule, the famed conservation biologist, I think the first conservation biologist that passed away last year, when he was asked, are you optimistic or pessimistic about the environment? He said, that's irrelevant. I am possibilistic. But he put a period at the end of that. And so what I try to do is try to understand what possibilistic could mean for conservation. And I think one, some of the things it can mean is that it's creative. It's systems thinking. It sees things that we get to do this work. We get to fix these problems. It is accessible and egalitarian. It recognizes that the process of relationship building, the process of learning, um, the process is as important as the product that we're trying to achieve as well. And there might be a focus or at least a blurring of the boundaries between intrinsic and instrumental motivations as well. And when the rest of the world is trying to figure out things like the Green New Deal or circular economies or regenerative economics in this post COVID recovery, maybe seeing conservation as an extension or an expression of humanity as who we are can help us when we're trying to help Pakistan in their 10 billion trees initiative or China with their multi-decade grain to green project, which is the single largest reforestation project that humanity has ever undertaken. And I think some of these ideas can help us understand that. And I guess the last thing that I'll leave you with is that all of this research took place over the last few years. But only in the last couple of weeks did I realize that not only is it happening here or wherever you may actually be on this call, but it's happening right now. And so just in the last couple of weeks, I learned that um, an hour and a half drive from where I'm sitting right now, there is a tree that owns itself. I mentioned the non-human personhood thing before and how it might be a little crazy to think about how a, a mountain or a tree or a, a river might own itself. But in Athens, Georgia, there is a tree that was um, owned by a man who loved that tree so much that he deeded the land to the tree itself. Now, this is actually the son of the tree that owns itself. But he did this in 1832, more than three decades prior to when all humans in the United States could own themselves. So it's actually not as crazy as we like to think it is. Also, I just learned that a three and a half hour drive from where I'm sitting, there is the one of the oldest, I think the actual oldest, um, what they call Paleo-Indian site in the Americas, where they found artifacts confirmed in science and nature, artifacts from over from 50,000 years ago. And I just talked to Dr. Goodyear a couple uh, weeks ago, and he gave me some incredible information. And then on the 28th of February, I was extended an invitation by Dr. Robinson to attend Dr. Rhonda Thomas's inaugural Call My Name tour of campus, where a bunch of people walked the campus and saw it for the first time through the lens of these conflict histories to understand the, the African-American, the enslaved person experience, the experience of how the university was built by convict child labor in some places. And then we also visited the Woodland Cemetery where just this time last year, there was expected to be about a hundred unmarked graves. And just because somebody looked, they found that as of the 28th of February, there were over 600 unmarked graves of African-Americans in that area. So all of this is happening right here and right now. And like this uh, fierce warrior princess that I got to meet out in the forest, my hope is that we can take some of this information and we can have the courage and the inspiration, maybe the tenacity to understand who we are as people in our relationship, in a better relationship with not just this forest, 
but nature in general. Thank you.